Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for OA Week 2023. My name is Sarah Flickinger and I'm an Associate Research Scientist at the OAICC. I'm also a member of the Goa On Secretariat. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to announce that this session is being recorded for later posting on YouTube. OA Week is presented by four sponsoring organizations. First of all, Goa On, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Second, NOAA, the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Third, the International Atomic Energy Agency, OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And last but not least, the IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So Goa On was established in 2012 with just a handful of members, and since then it has grown immensely. We now have over 1,000 members from 114 countries with wide global distribution, as you can see on this map here. There are nine regional hubs, um, as you can see on the icons on this map, that span continents and oceanographic regions. We'll be hearing from most of these hubs during OA Week, and especially we will be hearing from the Med Hub today. If you're not yet a member of Goa On, we welcome all members and you can join by visiting goaon.org now. OA Week debuted in 2020 and returned in 2021 when events and conferences were postponed due to COVID-19. Following the successful in-person symposium on the ocean in a high CO2 world in 2022, Goa On is bringing back OA Week in 2023 to maintain the momentum around OA research and to provide a virtual platform for the ocean acidification community to exchange their latest findings. We are thrilled to present a wide range of ocean acidification topics and speakers from around the world. So a few quick logistics um, before the presentation starts. All participants are in listen-only mode right now during our presentations, but we welcome any questions in the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will be monitoring incoming questions, and the moderators will pose these questions to our speakers during the question and answer section, which will begin immediately after our final presentation today. And during this Q&A discussion at the end, you can also use the raise hand function, which you can find in that same toolbox at the bottom of your screen. And we will call on you to unmute and you can ask your question directly to our speakers. So with those logistics out of the way, um, I'm thrilled to announce that the OA MedHub session um, is about to begin. And we will be hearing from um, a number of different uh, researchers from around the Mediterranean uh, region to discuss their research. Without further ado, um, I will announce your moderators who are also the co-chairs of the OA MedHub Goa On Regional Hub. First of all, we have Iris Hendricks, um, who defended her thesis in 2004 at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. She moved to Spain where she is now a permanent researcher working for the Spanish Research Council at the Mediterranean Institute for Advanced Studies in Mallorca. Since 2018, Iris is leading a monitoring series in the Balearic Islands, uh, the Balearic Islands Ocean Acidification Time Series, or BOATS, where she monitors coastal pH. She is evaluating how much of the observed variation is caused by marine vegetation, and she is interested in the carbon drawdown behind the pH signal and subsequent burial by coastal vegetation. Finally, she is interested in how much of the sea air emissions of greenhouse gases are influenced by processes in coastal marine vegetation. Welcome, Iris. <clears throat> and secondly, we have with us the other co-chair of the OA Med Hub, Abed al Rahman Hassoum. Dr. Hassoun holds a PhD in oceanology since 2014. He is currently a researcher at Geomar Kiel in Germany, working on extracting gaps in the EU ocean observing system to provide actionable recommendations to the EU Commission. His main study area is the Mediterranean Sea. He is interested in long-term marine biogeochemical trends, including ocean acidification, deoxygenation, and warming in the context of climate change. He is also interested in assessing impacts of climate change on biodiversity, mainly on phytoplankton and the occurrence of harmful algal blooms. He supervised several masters and PhD students and is also the co-champion of Outcome 6 in ORS Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability. Uh, Abed and Iris, thank you so much for being here today, and the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for this nice introduction. So uh, as many of you already know that the Ocean uh, Acidification Mediterranean Hub is a network that connects Mediterranean scientists who are working and are interested in ocean acidification in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, we would like to welcome all of you being part of this uh, session. This is like a festival for us, for the community, in order to really share actually uh, our work uh, to hear each other and it's an opportunity of exchanges as well. So we are part of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, Goa On, uh, and uh, this session will be dedicated to give a glimpse of current ocean acidification work by a selection of our uh, very well esteemed members in the OA Med Hub. So talks will, uh, will target ocean acidification in this region over a large time scale from reconstruction of past events uh, paleontology, so ocean acidification paleontology to current evidence of impacts on key organisms. And so we hope that this session will be an opportunity uh, not only to gather you here, uh, many of you are already here and have, have heard many of uh, uh, the talks, but also to initialize discussions that might open up collaborations and fruitful exchanges. I'm going to give the floor now to my co-chair, the newly elected co-chair, Iris. The floor is yours. Thank you, Avet, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of today, which is, uh, who is Patricia Severi. She is a ICREA research professor at the University of uh, Autónoma de Barcelona, where she coordinates the Marine and Environmental Biogeosciences Research Group that catalyzes research on the natural and human-driven marine processes and sustainability challenges. Uh, her broad scientific interest is on marine global environmental change, ecology and biogeochemistry at various time scales and complexity. She focuses on multidisciplinary investigation from target marine organisms at the base of the food web to marine microplastics and biogeochemical processes. With the research group, she works on the ocean in a changing climate and under human pressure, linking CO2 dynamics, climate change and target marine processes. She's interested in pressing threats to the marine environment and their societal relevance, such as ocean acidification, warming and oxygen loss in different regions, both in coastal systems and open seas, from social to biochemical processes. And um, uh, hereby the floor is yours, Patricia. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hear your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's great to be here today in uh, this session. And so I'm here today to actually present uh, something that we is still in progress, but we have some interesting results that I would like to share with you on the vulnerability and resilience of Mediterranean uh, ecosystem to uh, ocean acidification. This work, of course, is a collaboration of many people and uh, both from my group at the ITA UAB, but also other collaborators like Iris Hendricks, Fred, Frederic Gazo, and many others that hopefully will join us in this, uh, in this effort. So when we look at the uh, systematic review and what has been published in terms of uh, ocean acidification research in the Mediterranean Sea, there was a very nice paper last year uh, that was led by Abed Asun. And this paper uh, that was published in Frontiers in Marine Sciences look at the entire database of papers from the Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center Bibliographic Database. And you look at the, yes? Are you sharing your screen? Uh, we don't, I don't think we see your slides, sorry. I thought I did, but <laughs> just a second. One second. Can you see it now? Perfect. Yes, just can, yeah. I apologize for this. Can you see it? Perfect. Yes? Okay, perfect. So, start again. <laughs> so, it's great to be here. And I'm here today to talk about uh, work that is still in progress, but we have some interesting results to share. And it's about vulnerability and resilience of Mediterranean ecosystem to ocean acidification. So, the, this work is the effort is coming out from the effort of many people. So from my group at the ICTA UAB, but also collaborators like Iris Hendricks, Roderick Gazo, and hopefully other colleagues that will join us in this, uh, in this initiative. So when we see uh, 
uh, when we look at the ocean acidification research in the Mediterranean Sea, there was a nice paper that was published last year and it was led by Abed Asun. And in this paper that they were using, it was a, a systematic review uh, of uh, articles uh, that were listed in the bibliographic database of the Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. We could see the evolution of papers and the different topics. And in this plot here, that is from this paper, you see the number of articles and near the timeline. And what is interesting here, and also the different topics, and what is interesting here is that basically all the knowledge that we have about Mediterranean acidification is coming from the last 10 years or so. And so there is a large amount of knowledge and information that need to be explored much more in order to understand the problems in, in the, in, of the Mediterranean acidification. And so the, this, uh, this uh, paper, this, uh, this study is focusing on the biological response of, of, ocean acid, of, uh, of organism to ocean acidifications. And of course the motivation is obvious, the Mediterranean is under pressure by anthropogenic uh, drivers and climate change, and ocean acidification is one of these important drivers that's changing the, the marine ecosystems and the biogeochemistry. And these are important, uh, of course, this is important, uh, uh, this knowledge is important because we wanted also to be able to apply all this uh, conservation protect, protection and regeneration strategy in a, proper, in a proper way. So we really need to know the vulnerability and resilience of uh, this key marine ecosystem. Also it's important for carbon sequestrations uh, to know the status and the vulnerability of the marine ecosystems. And we really need to move, and you will see from this presentation, from single species to ecosystems. And also we uh, actually apply a, a method here that is a process-based approach. And I will elaborate a bit on this uh, in this presentation. So we did this classical systematic review. Uh, we started from the world of science uh, and from the ocean acidification ICC bibliographic database with a, a, lar a large number of papers and through a selection, uh, removing duplicate, removing uh, paper that were not fitting with the inclusion criteria, we ended with 328 uh, uh, records. <clears throat> so key numbers related to this uh, systematic review that uh, we are doing uh, uh, in this study is, so we had these 328 uh, uh, papers. They represent about 60% of the total paper published on ocean acidification in the Mediterranean Sea. The time span is from 1992 to December, 2022. And what we have done, of course, is to have a strategy to simplify the data, the large database that is available. And we divided in two major groups, uh, the organism that were, uh, they were studied. One is the benthic habitat and one is the pelagic hab habitat. So in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, numbers, you see already that there is a quite a discrepancy in terms of effort that has been done to understand the biological response. So almost 75%, 74% of study are addressing benthic system and only 26 they are on the pelagic system. And for benthic system are basically the habitats that are uh, mainly coastal <coughs> uh, benthic system. And for pelagic system are the organism that live in the water column and mainly of course at the, in the, surf, in the upper part of the water column. When you look at the taxonomic group, there are many uh, species that's been uh, that been studied, and we summarize the, all the different uh, uh, effort of studying the single species in, in, in key taxonomic groups. And also, we simplify uh, all the different processes that have been explored in actually seven key uh, processes, physiological ecological processes that are systematically uh, studied in many, many different, uh, many different experiments and, and mesocosm uh, studies and so on. And here you see the evolution of benthic versus uh, pelagic uh, studies. Just quickly here, the articles, number of articles per year, you see from 1992 to December 2022. And here are the approach that has been used in this different uh, effort of uh, different studies. You see uh, that many papers are dealing with CO2 vents and the CO2 vents uh, sites in the Mediterranean are quite uh, well used for acidification, as you can tell. So this is one of the major uh, major approach that is used to explore acidification. And you see that they are mainly for benthic organisms. <clears throat> Planktonic are not very much used, of course, in this kind of settings. And then we have laboratory experiments that are used for both planktonic and uh, benthic systems. 
And uh, also mesocosm. Mesocosm is also another uh, important approach that is used. And you see that for mesocosm, a uh, larger number of study has been done uh, for planktonic compared to benthic uh, organisms. I forgot to mention quickly that also field study are included here. Of course, field study are not studying the biological response to ocean acidification in a very uh, in, in a very uh, concrete way, but they are helping us to understand a bit more about the relationship of seawater carbonate chemistry with ecology or with some specific physiological processes. So these are the most studied taxonomic groups that we have considered. And, uh, and so this is the, are the, uh, from the mollusca to, uh, to arthro uh, arthropod. And you see that there is also disparity in terms of, uh, of study. Uh, mollusca, bivalves, and gastropods are the ones that are most studied, but also cnidaria like uh, uh, anthozoa, like corals or anemonas are also very much studied. And in blue, compared to this uh, light blue color, you see basically the single species study versus the community study. Of course, you see the majority are single use, uh, uh, single species, uh, single use, single species study. And here is the pelagic, uh, uh, pelagic study. And you also here you see the disparity with the bacteria being uh, very much studied compared to the uh, compared to the others. And here you see also the study on the community. Here are the key uh, physiological and ecological uh, processes. Uh, so we go from abundance, classification, and of course, the key process that has been studied since the very beginning when we address acidification, but also the few study addressing community, they study uh, biodiversity change in both pelagic and, and benthic systems. You have growth and also interest photosynthesis, of course, but also survival. And you see survival in benthics is much wider uh, studies than 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 pelagic than plankton uh, organisms, and here is like a summary of, of what uh, of our strategy and the results. So when you look at pelagic habitat, pelagic ecosystem versus benthic ecosystems, and here you see uh, the response. Uh, here is the list of processes, and eventually the response to uh, to the stressors to the ocean acidification drivers. And in a very simplified way, we have positive, negative, and then shift mainly. Uh, when you look, when you focus your eye on the orange, it is the negative uh, response uh, of the process to uh, to the driver, so to ocean acidification. You see, first of all, for example, classification for both groups, pelagic and benthic, is very much negatively impacted. But when you look at other processes and you compare these two large groups, benthic ecosystems are in general uh, very much negatively impacted, almost for all the uh, processes. Uh, by acidifications, you see the orange is dominant. And then for the uh, pelagic ecosystem, you have a more a shift type of uh, response. And just to uh, briefly conclude what we have been found for now is that most of the physiological processes are affected by acidification. And when you look at the overall comparison between benthic habitat, benthic ecosystem, and pelagic ecosystem, you have a more likely a, a vulnerable uh, a response of ocean, to ocean acidification of coastal benthic system compared to pelagic. And when we look at more in detail, it looks like Mediterranean subtide, uh, subtidal uh, rocky reef are particularly vulnerable. We have many challenges here uh, related to this da large database. Uh, of course, there is a disparity in terms of uh, number of studies. So there are mainly benthic studies. And so we are also to look into uh, also correction maybe with the number of studies from benthic and pelagics. And so I'll consider this in the conclusion. Uh, sometimes it's difficult, of course, to address uh, resilience since uh, most of the paper actually they are uh, more likely uh, publishing negative response. And also another issue with the, uh, addressing resilience, for example, for pelagic or planktonic organisms, that uh, bacteria are the, the dominant uh, taxonomic group that have been tested in pelagic and they are resilient to acidification. So this can be a bias also to see the pelagic are more uh, resistant or resilient to acidification. And uh, also, of course, for strategy, we need to consider current ecological status and, and also eventually uh, the multi drivers and just for the work in progress, we are uh, we are now exploring the database and to perform uh, meta analysis. So the ocean we have a very beautiful ocean acidification international coordination database that uh, have this meta analysis. There's this data available, and we want to explore uh, the data more. 
even of course there's a challenge that there are about 50 60 percent of the entire data are available only and then we also do something novel and in parallel it is the machine learning then application of artificial intelligence uh, approach that is a complementary method to the systematic review and we are exploring this with the OAICC bibliographic uh, database and we have this topic modeling uh, approach uh, to basically explore specific topics and uh, specific evolution of topics in this uh, natural language uh, processing and and I don't have time now to explore this but maybe there is there are question about this thank you <laughs> Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, so remember, the questions are uh, until the end. OK, thank you so much, Patricia. Now the floor is uh, for Sven Pallax. Sven uh, will talk actually about the anthropogenic acidification of surface waters drives decre uh, that decrease biogenic calcification in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, Sven is a newly, um, he, he newly finished actually his PhD uh, also uh, with uh, Patricia. So he was working um, uh, with Patricia's team uh, in uh, the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, Spain. Congratulations, Sven, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Abed, uh, for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure. So uh, you see the presentation right now, right? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Good, good. Um, yeah, um, how you said I'm talking today about like how um, anthropogenic acidification um, has uh, changed, like or has manipulated the biogenic um, um, calcification in Mediterranean surface water. Um, and uh, this presentation is based on a study which was just published by the end of August this year, which was also uh, done with like uh, Patricia Civelli and um, other collaborators. And um, yeah, to analyze that, I'm using the skeletal fossil remains in marine sediments, um, in specifically like uh, the South Atlantic foraminifera, which you can see here on the right hand side of the picture. So um, every year, 25 to 30% of the CO2, we are emitting this um, sucked up by the ocean. And this is changing the seawater chemistry towards like a lower pH. Um, and, uh, and since the um, yeah, onset of the Industrial Revolution, this pH has dropped by around like um, <clears throat> 0.1 pH units. And if we look at um, projections uh, to the future, um, um, we estimate that this pH drop will be around like 0 0.5 until the end of the century. So we will arrive by around 7.8 uh, pH units by 2100. And if we put like this into the context of longer geological um, time, we see uh, through like a reconstruction of pH, of the oceanic pH, that um, the anthropogenic Ocean acidification, so the drop of pH we're experiencing now is um, unprecedented in the last 20 million years. So, no marine organisms have experienced such a high rate and uh, low level of pH since that time. And um, this is changing, yeah, or this is affecting uh, marine organisms um, since when CO2 um, is intruded into the seawater, uh, it increases like a hydrogen. Ions and uh, this is, is a cause for like the drop of pH and at the same time it decreases the availability of uh, carbonate ions and this is affecting in particular um, calcifying organisms. So we know from laboratory studies that the process most affected uh, in marine calcifiers is calcification. So what we know so far uh, very well is how like the seawater chemistry has changed throughout like the last years and decades and how the marine organisms um, react to that based on laboratory studies. But what we don't know is how um, marine organisms react to like this anthropogenic acidification over longer time scales. So over like the last 150 years or, or up to millennia. And at the same time, since most of the studies come from like cut experiments or laboratory um, uh, studies, uh, which deal in or which analyze this response in a controlled system, 
Um, we don't really know how marine organisms uh, react like in real life uh, when yeah, there is like a combined effect of several environmental parameters. And to overcome like this knowledge gap, um, we stated the question um, how like anthropogenic acidification is modulating biogenic participation over longer time scales. So from particularly from like the pre to post industrial era, where like the pH drop is um, yeah particularly high, um, and how they react in a natural environment. So um, we try to conduct like these studies, and the approach we use is that um, we analyze ocean sediment cores. Uh, further, yeah, to have like field studies, and uh, secondly, to um, further reconstruct uh, this marine life response to ocean acidification further beyond like instrumental records. And we did this in a critically sensitive study area, which is the Mediterranean Sea, as the Mediterranean surface waters are high uh, in alkalinity, and um, the yeah, waters in the basin have like a very fast turnover rate. Which means that they are highly susceptible to carbon or anthropogenic carbon uptake, which is associated with ocean acidification. And then we used like um, another group of plankton organisms, which are here like plankton foraminifera, to uh, translate our results into other classifying organisms like theropods or coccolithophores. So, what you can see here on the left picture is like a living plankton foraminifera. They are like single cell organisms, a couple of hundred micrometers in size, and live, live in the uh, surface of the ocean. And after the death, the um, calcite shell they produce is sinking down to the seabed and depositing there over like hundreds to thousands of years. So, albeit their high robustness of the shell, which can lie in the sediment more than hundreds, a uh, hundred million uh, years. Um, they are highly sensitive to changes in seawater uh, chemistry, which makes them like an ideal reporter for pH changes or carbonic ion uh, concentration changes. So, um, if we look at lab studies, um, which yeah, analyze like the um, changes um, of the shell weight in, in response to carbonic ion concentration, which is also highly associated with pH, we can see that. Um, when the carbon ion concentration or the pH is going down, the mean shell weight um, is getting lighter as well. And the mean shell weight can be seen here as a proxy for biogenic calcification. We know also from other studies uh, or from ocean uh, sediment studies that during times of uh, low atmospheric CO2, so that means when the pH in the ocean was high, that uh, shells were um, way heavier. But again, um, the knowledge gap we have here is that most of the studies are based on lab uh, or culture studies, and uh, we are missing um, a high resolution record which covers the pre industrial uh, to post industrial uh, transition to really assess um, how big like the impact of anthropogenic acidification is on this organism. And to overcome like this gap, uh, we collected like three sediment cores in the Western Mediterranean Sea. So one core in the Alborian Sea and one in the Balearic Sea, which covered us around 2,000 years, and one high-resolution core in the Strait of Sicily, which is covering uh, the last uh, 200 years or so. And then we analyzed uh, two different species, uh, Geolangatus and Zibeloides. They are living more or less like at the same water depth, so to make sure that they are capturing. Um, the same uh, signal of seawater chemistry changes. And uh, then to um, and then we weighted like every single shell and uh, normalized the cell against the size to get um, yeah, a proxy for like calcification changes. And additionally to that, we look at the geochemical signal in the shell, which gives us yeah, an insight about the uh, seawater chemistry changes. So, for example, the isotopic ratio between carbon 13 and carbon 12 gives us information about like how many anthropogenic carbon has included into the ocean. And the ratio between boron 11 to boron 10 uh, gives us like an idea of how the pH has changed. So, if we look at the results, which are plotted here um, against like the x axis, which covers the last 2000 years, so from left uh, to past. 
to um, the right to present. Um, on the lower y-axis, we see the classification change in form of size normalized weight changes, so weight changes of the shell. And uh, in the two middle y-axis, we see like the geochemical signal, so how the pH has changed and how the um, yeah, intrusion of anthropogenic carbon um, has changed the geochemical signal of the shell. And <clears throat> in the top y-axis, uh, we can see the atmospheric CO2 concentration. So what we see in the pre-industrial era, like uh, prior to 1800, is that when you had like quite a stable atmospheric CO2 concentration, um, there was, or like the intrusion of anthropogenic CO2 was quite low and stable, and the pH was quite high and didn't change as well. And along with that, we don't see big changes in the size normalized weight, so no big changes in the biogenic classification of uh, that organism. In contrast, if we look at the industrial era, so the last 150 to the last 200 years, um, where which is characterized by like a high spark uh, or a high sp spike of um, atmospheric CO2 concentration, we can see that this is <clears throat> or this signal is incorporated in the geochemical or in the shell of the plankton foraminifera. So um, we see like a high intrusion of anthropogenic CO2 in the surface water and a drop of pH. And along with that, we see a yeah, drastic decrease of size normalized weight of the shell, which we yeah, um, uh, interpret as a decrease of biogenic classification. So if we summarize the, um, this result like in a scheme, we uh, come from like the pre-industrial world where the low, uh, where like the atmospheric CO2 was low, uh, the carbon ion concentration in the surface water was high. And therefore, like the shell work was quite high. So the biogenic uh, classification worked well during that time. While we're entering like the last 150 years in the industrial era, uh, when we have like a high CO2 world, the pH drops uh, and the size normalized weight um, and the biogenic classification is decreasing as well. So to summarize the results uh, from that study is that we can see that anthropogenic acidification already impedes like plankton for mineral classification in the Mediterranean surface water. And since this is like a model organism, we can translate this result into other plankton calcified like copolysphos and pteropods, which we expect to decrease their biogenic classification um, throughout this century with ongoing ocean acidification. As well, we present here a quite um, robust approach since we are looking at like two different species and at three different locations. So this interspecies seven wide so a seven wide approach um, gives us like a high confidence, low variability assessment of the result. And finally, um, this is the first study which shows like the enhanced anthropogenic CO2 uptake uh, and a decrease in pH in the geochemical signal of the planted or military shell. So yeah, thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm happy for for any questions uh, about this uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Sven. So Sven is a marine ge geoscientist, as you've uh, you've uh, heard his very interesting talk. And during so his his PhD, he analyzed the skeletal remains of marine organisms in the Mediterranean Sea sediments, and to reconstruct marine ecosystem dynamics beyond the temporal scale of instrumental records to assess impacts of a human versus naturally induced climate pressure. I didn't say that before. Thank you so much, Sven, and congratulations again for your PhD and for the questions th that will be later on. So the floor is yours, Iris, to introduce our next speaker. Yes, thank you, Amit. And thank you, Sven, for the interesting talk. All the talks have been very interesting up to now. So um, let's continue with our third speaker, which is Frederic Asso, who, uh, who you might know because um, since 2016, he's a member of Sola Simba, working group of, on ocean acidification and, and uh, advisory board of and focal point for data management of the Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center, or uh, OAICC, so very involved uh, community member of the Mediterranean Hub. And he works at the CNRS as a biologist and biochemist, biochemist with expertise on coastal metabolism, effects of ocean acidification and warming on various marine organisms, and especially bivalves. 
uh, and he uses techniques to study the effects on of environmental drivers on marine communities, benthic, both benthic and pelagic, uh, in the laboratory and in the field. And he joined the laboratory of um, the Oceanographie de Villefranche in 2009 and currently is the deputy director. So um, he will talk to us about the future of shellfish farming in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, I look forward to hear your talk, Fred. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you, Iris. Thank you. And hello, everybody. I'm sharing my screen. Does that work? Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, a project we've been running in the last uh, in the last two and two or three years, and that is uh, currently ongoing. So I will show you um, data that we have and certainly nice data you will see. Um, so the talk is about future of shellfish farming in the Mediterranean Sea. This is a project and a study that is connected in the frame of the Cocorico 2 uh, project. Uh, which involves uh, IFREMER, CNRS, and the Regional Committee of Shellfish Farming in the Mediterranean Sea. So why do we care about uh, shellfish farming? Um, first, you, you certainly know that uh, we use more and more uh, shellfish meat, uh, basically, in the, in the world, and we produce more and more of these uh, species around the world, especially in Asia, but also in other in other countries, uh, this represents now something like 11% of what we produce uh, in terms of aquaculture. And uh, most of this, uh, this uh, shellfish source are coming from, from real aquaculture in marine waters. It's like almost 90% nowadays. So you can see a plot here. I don't know if you see my, my mouse, but I, I guess you do. Um, you can see that the production of shellfish around the world is increasing drastically. Uh, after the 1980s, and that the income that is giving to uh, to uh, human societies is in, is increasing uh, drastically as well. Yes, and uh, so what do we produce in the world? Mostly uh, oysters. Uh, they represent uh, 36 percent of uh, what we produce. Clams are also important. Mussels and uh, pectens as well. And um, the shellfish are. Not only interesting in terms of um, of uh, meat, of course, of source of proteins, but it's uh, these are species that are regulating uh, the ecosystem because they they can uh, ingest uh, lots of particles and they can clear the water and by doing this they they favor uh, the growth of uh, macroalgae, so they are really important in terms of cultural um, profits and uh, provisioning, of course, as I said. And shellfish, as uh, you saw in the last uh, in the last talk, are certainly one of the groups that are the most impacted by uh, ocean acidification. But not only. So here I'm showing you all the major threats that are that are certainly a problem in the coming in the coming decades for shellfish farming. Ocean acidification, of course, but global warming as well. Um, harmful algal blooms and pathogen and extreme events, food availability, desoxygenation, and freshwater inputs. So what we would like, what we need to know is what will be the future of uh, this uh, source of proteins uh, that is in increasingly uh, important in the world. And uh, we need to, to, of course, provide data, scientific data showing to the producers and to the societies how it will work in the coming decades. So we have to take into account biological acclimation and adaptation, of course, if we want to project to the end of the century or even before, uh, during the century, and we need also to discuss and to 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 try to build uh, societal uh, solutions and uh, adaptation to this uh, important source of proteins. So, by uh, thanks to the OAICC, so the Ocean Acidification International Co Coordination Center, we we had a consultancy last year that, uh, based on the OAICC database, tried to. Uh, to grab the pitfalls and the gaps that we have in this field of research. And the first plot I, I would like to show you is the exposure time uh, of the different studies that have been conduct, conduct, conducted on, uh, on shellfish. So you can see larvae on the left and uh, benthic um, um, organisms on, on the right. So spat, juveniles, and adults. And what I would like to show you is that most, the la large majority of uh, the studies that have been conducted so far 
considered uh, an acclimation time of uh, less than 100 days, so really few months, which in my sense doesn't uh, provide a clear answer on how the organisms will be able to acclimatize and even to adapt. We need to consider multi-generation. Another gap that we have is that, as I said, the ocean acidification is not the only uh, stressor that we have to take into account. And for the moment, around 60% of the studies uh, considered only a pH as a, as a stressing factor. And uh, now it's increasing, of course, with time, and that's a good thing. Temperature is one of the most uh, studied co-variable uh, of, uh, of pH, but you can see over stressors that are uh, represented here on this plot, uh, for instance, oxygen, salinity, pathogens, etc. Et a very important <laughs> gap and pitfall for me is that uh, most, the, yeah, the large majority, around 80% of the studies that have been conducted so far consider uh, unlimited food uh, resource for these organisms in, in culture. And to me, this and to us in, in our project, this is a big, big problem because, of course, since if you have lots of energy, you are able to fight many stressors, and which is not the case in the field, of course, because concentration of chlorophyll is varying a lot uh, in time. Uh, so, in our sense, most experiments that have been conducted so far were not conducted under uh, realistic conditions because also they consider stable uh, levels of forcing factors, which is not the case in the field, as you will see. They considered unlimited food, which is again not the, not the case in the field, and no pathogens. Most of the studies, they filter uh, water, they, they UV uh, water to remove the pathogens. And that's something, of course, we need to take into account. So the objective of our, of our work is uh, that started in 2020 and with different partners that you can see here on the, on the left with different tasks. Today, I'm going to focus on the, on the second task of this project, but I will show you some some uh, glimpse on the uh, the first uh, the first task with uh, that is focusing on the observation. This is a project that has been funded by the EMFF, uh, European Maritime and Fisheries Funds. So what we wanted to do in part of this second task is to conduct two experiments in contrasted uh, study sites. One in Brittany, so really the Atlantic coast with. Uh, with the tides and uh, another one in the Mediterranean Sea. And that's on this one that I will focus uh, today. It's an experiment that started in October, 2022. And uh, we exposed um, mussels and oysters, maybe I have, yeah, mussels and oysters uh, to different scenarios of uh, global change uh, to the year 2050, 2075 and the end of the century. And you can see here, within the, the red square that the different uh, offsets of temperature and pH that we considered for the different um, different time periods. So for, for, for instance, for the end of the century in the Mediterranean Sea, the models project an increase of temperature of 2.7, let's say degrees and a decrease of pH of minus 0 0.26. 26. So again, we wanted to be very realistic. So to conduct the experiment really close to where uh, the organisms are actually cultured, cultivated. Here you can see a small, a small map. I don't know if you can see here, but these are oyster tables. And our experiment was conducted here. And we were pumping seawater around here. So we are actually using the seawater that is used for the cultivation, of course, of the, of the organisms. Um, so again, I'm focusing on the on the Mediterranean side, which is the Toll Lagoon, and the Toll Lagoon here is part of our first task, observing. And we started a network in 2021 that is currently submitted actually to ESSD on 13 sites along the French littoral, and we focused on uh, inshore where shellfish farming is conducted and offshore sites for all the different regions. So we start from, from North Brittany to, to the Mediterranean Sea, the Toll Lagoon again, and offshore set. We have pH sensors uh, installed, deployed on each of these sites, uh, CFETs, and we conduct spectrophotometric pH measurements on a regular basis and measurement of total alkalinity and total carbon in order to have a full characterization of the carbonate chemistry. And you can see here on the Toll Lagoon, which is the red, and you can see in blue the offshore. So this is few few miles 
of uh, set really in the offshore Mediterranean Sea. You can see that the pH is pretty stable, of course, in the Mediterranean Sea, which is not the case in the lagoon where we have huge variations in pH and especially very low values here in, in, uh, in fall, that was in 2022. I don't have the data for 2023, but we know that the pH declined also or decreased at very low levels also at this period. And omega aragonite, which is um, really important for calcifiers, is uh, also very low in, uh, in fall with values close to two, even below two. So what we have done is actually we wanted, we don't have a lab, of course, close to these, uh, to these shellfish farming areas. What we wanted to do is to develop uh, mobile experimental facilities. So these are, this has been done in shipping containers. And you can see some, uh, some uh, pictures or some um, uh, sketch of um, what we wanted to develop. Uh, the, each container, so we have one in Brittany, one in the Mediterranean Sea, which are exactly the same comprise 12 mesocosm. Uh, of course, uh, everything that we need to uh, mix uh, water, so hot water with uh, ambient seawater to increase temperature. And we have also an acidified tank where we bubble CO2 to regulate pH also in the different, um, different mesocosms. So you can see here now a picture of what, uh, what it is. And this is the one that is deployed in the Mediterranean Sea. So you can see the 12 mesocosms here. Of course, this picture was taken before we, we installed the organisms inside. And everything is automatized. And we have a full uh, uh, control of uh, different, uh, different factors, so pH and temperature. So you can see here the control. On the top, you can see 2050 here, 2075, 2100, the, the end of the century. And we can we have a minute uh, measurement of each parameter. And we can uh, check the data on, uh, on live, basically. And we, uh, we have alerts also that uh, allow for when we need to, uh, to, to go to the container to change some things and to, to maintain the, the experiment. So we conducted a testing phase in Brittany in 2022. I show you very quickly the results here. So you can see the temperature offset. You can see here in dashed line, in dotted line, sorry, the, the targeted offset that we wanted. And you can see the minute uh, uh, data of uh, temperature, but also in, here in pH. And you can see the uh, daily average uh, temperature offset and pH offset. And you can see that really our, we were really happy with this system. And it works perfectly with almost no no problem that we encountered during this uh, almost, well, nine month uh, testing period. So we said, okay, let's go. Let's start an experiment in the Mediterranean Sea. That's what we did. We started in October, 2022. And I show you here the data that are, yeah, that are uh, updated until until now, uh, almost uh, mid-October. Mid so you can see that uh, the temperature, uh, of course, has been increased in the 2100, which is in red. Everything in the, in the next slide, uh, you will see that uh, the end of the century is in red, 2075 in green, 2050 in blue, and the control is in black. And you can see the ambient, this, basically this is the measurement of pH and temperature in the ambient seawater. So you can see that the control seawater is actually exactly the same than in the ambient. That's what we want. We want to be realis realistic. And uh, we have the perfect uh, offset uh, between uh, the control and the different uh, scenario. I show you here only a really tiny uh, issue that we had for two or three weeks uh, at the start of the year where the heat pump was not working. So we were not able to modify temperature, but this is really minor uh, problem that we had. Again, we wanted to be very realistic in what we, what we do. And here I show you the individual wet weight of oysters that are deployed in the container, in the control uh, mesocosm, so under ambient seawater, and uh, the same oysters, the same cohort that has been deployed in situ uh, in, the, in the lagoon. And you can see that the growth that we obtained in the, in the experiment is exactly the same as what we have uh, in situ. So that's, that was really important to us. Now, if we have a look at the growth, uh, so I show you here the individual fresh weight gain. So that's an increase in terms of weight, of fresh weight in the different scenarios, so in the control in 2075 and 2100. And we were really surprised to see that we have a clear if effect of the scenarios uh, for the, the next decade with a, a maximum decrease of growth of minus 
in the scenario of, uh, of the end of the century. So this is not a, ma a minor uh, problem, but uh, definitely the, the, the farmers will have to, to, to fight in the coming, coming decades. For the mussels, this is mostly the same. We have uh, a clear effect of, uh, of, uh, of warming and acidification at the end of the century, but also before that, in 2050, we have a minus 15% decrease in, in growth at that, uh, for, this, uh, for this scenario. And here I show you the difference in terms of growth before summer. Why? Because you will see in the next slide that uh, during summer, we had huge problems with mussels. So this is actually the survival of, uh, of oysters uh, during the experiment. Oysters are very resilient to the, to, in terms of survival to the different scenario. And you can see that since we, we still have a, a significant decrease of survival with, uh, at the end of the century and even before, but we are still above 90% of survival after one year of experiment. So this is not a drastic uh, decrease. For mussels, this is completely different. Mussels, unfortunately, in the scenario for the end of the century, there were was were was a complete death basically of the, of the mussels, uh, which was followed by 2075 and 2050. So now only mussels from the ambient are doing good actually, and but they yeah they, they were the only one to survive. Of course, this is for us since pH was pretty high in summer. We don't think that pH was the major issue, but of course temperature. We are inside the lagoon. And as you can see on this plot here, we had periods where in the, the end of the century scenario, we were well above 30 degrees. And we, we know basically that they cannot tolerate uh, these kind of temperatures for more than a few weeks, and which, which is not the case in the end of the century. We are always far above this limit. Uh, we had another uh, kind of a heat wave in the uh, in, uh, beginning of August that was certainly the reason for the death basically of the, of the mussels in, uh, in culture for 2015, 2075. Now uh, we wanted to do a multi-generation experiment. So what we did is to, to take the, we did it on oysters because mussels, they were not ripe basically in June and we did it for oysters and we had a, a fertilization phase with the production of the second generation that was conducted in, uh, in Brittany actually under the same temperature and pH. We were stripping 10 males and 10 females per replica. So up here, I'm showing you the different fertilization rate for the different scenario. So the ambient 2050, 2075, and the end of the century, you can see that we have a, a decrease of fertilization rate uh, with the different scenarios. That's the same and even worse for the survival rates. We had a pretty good survival rate in the ambient, but which was very low, almost 5% at the end of the century. So definitely larval development will be impacted uh, in the coming decades, because certainly the, the, the organisms uh, were not ripe enough and were not having enough reserves in the eggs. If I, I'm looking at uh, fixation rates, so you can see here that we have no difference, basically, because the one that survived, the larvae that survived, they were able to fix. That's some, but they were much less, of course, in the end of the century scenario. Now the second generation is uh, is in culture, and here I'm showing you with individual fresh weight gain for the the, um, the G1 uh, generation. This, this has been deployed now in the mesocosm with the uh, first generation G0 in September 2023, and you can see the same. We after only a few weeks of uh, of deployment in the different scenario, we can see uh, a difference that appears. Uh, between the ambient condition and the future scenarios. So we will continue, of course, this to have uh, the, to have uh, more complete results in the coming months. So just to conclude very quickly, uh, we took samples, measurements on a three-month basis for many parameters that we are still under investigation now, the lipid content, transcriptomics, but also something that I will be very interested to look at, uh, which is the shell structure and mineralogy. And a colleague from... Uh, from uh, Scotland, uh, Susan Fitzer is, uh, is going to do these measurements. Uh, we have also, uh, thanks to a collaboration with uh, German uh, colleagues, uh, the measurement of emolymph pH and iron content, but also enzymes. I I'm putting this in red because this is something we would like to do in terms of collaboration. We have lots of samples that are stored at minus 80 of tissue samples that are available. If you're interested to join us in this uh, story, then 
the floor is yours. You can you can tell me, and we will we can try to to collaborate. So again, generation one uh, it will be followed until the end of the year, and we hope perhaps longer. We we submitted a, a project, a follow up project to the Cocorico too. So we hope we will be able to continue and perhaps having a third generation in culture. And in terms of conclusion, this is pretty pretty easy. As you saw, both species will be impacted in terms of growth. Uh, you can see that the data are without any doubts in the in the coming decades. And especially for mussels, this will be a real problem to, to cultivate mussels in the lagoon in the coming decades. You can see that they cannot survive summer, basically. So you will need to remove them from the water before summer, and they certainly won't have time to develop and up it to be at a market size. So one of the idea that, that we have, and we are working on it with some shellfish farmers, is to moving cultures to offshore. That's what they start to do already. This is, of course, more, more costly. Uh, you have other problems with sea breams, for instance, that are eating a lot of mussels. So, but this is something we are currently discussing with the farmers to try to adapt uh, the culture uh, processes to the new con the conditions that will be in the lagoon in the coming decades. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fred. So um, now we move to our next speaker as uh, we are already running a little bit late. Abit, Absolutely. You... Thank you so much, Iris, and thank you, uh, Steve, for this interesting talk. So now I'm really uh, glad to introduce our next speaker, uh, Andor Kilish. So uh, uh, Andor, I, I'm not so sure if I'm well pronouncing your name. You are a biologist and a, a new member in our hub, actually, uh, and you are a member of the Department of Biology at Istanbul University in Turkey. Um, so uh, Andor uh, studies uh, um, uh, are related to the impacts of ocean acidification, hypoxia, xenobiotics on marine invertebrates by the lab controlled trials through different aspects, including physiological, histological, and molecular uh, techniques, uh, techniques. The floor is yours, Andor. Thank you, Abed, for introducing me. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, sorry. Today, uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about the multistressor effect of the uh, ocean acidification, microplastic, and uh, lanthanum, uh, which is a rare earth element uh, on the sea urchin, uh, Arbacia lixula. Sorry. Here we um, mainly focus on the uh, multi-stressor effect, combined effects uh, of the uh, stressors um, uh, increasing trends uh, like these stressors uh, using the some biological assays uh, which are uh, respiration rate and uh, total uh, solomocytes. Uh, solomocytes viability and the histological uh, alterations in adult uh, Arbacia lixula. So why we prefer the, these species? Uh, because uh, it has a, a common distribution in the marine environments, uh, especially in the Mediterranean Sea as indicated in the figure. And it's a, a good model organism uh, because it has a ecological balance and it accumulates uh, and, and many types of uh, pollutants. Uh, that's why it's a good bioindicator organism as well. And it has a high consumption rate by people, uh, especially people living uh, along the Mediterranean coast. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, there are no studies uh, on the multi stressors using these uh, stressors uh, effects uh, on the uh, Arbacia lixula uh, in the literature. So the data is uh, very crucial to uh, fill uh, in the gap. We co uh, collected the samples from the Saros Bay and uh, it is located in the 
uh, North Eastern Agency. And as you know, agency is a part of Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the same things uh, uh, were uh, uh, performed in different dates because uh, because of the uh, three replicates. And uh, you will see our experimental setup, uh, the used aquariums. And on the left side, uh, you will see uh, IK's Aquastar. Uh, uh, control and feedback systems to uh, manipulate the carbon dioxide uh, inside the seawater uh, in the aquariums uh, to obtain the intended uh, pH value, and we uh, recorded uh, all all the uh, values uh, using the uh, computer uh, during the uh, experimental uh, period. Um, uh, after the uh, organisms uh, transported to the uh, laboratory, uh, we uh, acclimate the uh, organisms uh, for nine days. Uh, then uh, we expose uh, the organisms to the stressors for 14 days, uh, as three replicates I uh, just said uh, before. Uh, using uh, stressors uh, single and uh, combined, uh, except for the control group. And we uh, preferred uh, 7.45 uh, pH value because, as you know, it's a uh, projected uh, value for the feature. And uh, for the microplastic uh, and uh, lantanum, uh, we uh, selected uh, environmentally uh, relevant uh, levels. Okay, let's go to the biological endpoints. Uh, for the respiration rate, uh, we uh, used three uh, individuals uh, from the each uh, aquarium, and we weighed each one. Then we placed into a chamber. Uh, with the magnetic steer and uh, clean sea water. Uh, then we uh, measured dissolved oxygen uh, uh, levels using, again, IKS uh, system uh, connected with the uh, oxygen probes. Here you will see the uh, equation, uh, uh, which is used to uh, calculate the respiration rate. The other parameters uh, are total seromocytes and seromocyte viability. Uh, for them, we uh, collected the uh, solomic uh, fluid from the peristomal membrane uh, on, side, uh, on the uh, oral side of the uh, organisms. Then uh, we uh, focused on the, especially four types of uh, seromocyte, which are phagocytes. Uh, will be tile cell and uh, white and uh, red spherules. Uh, the other uh, our essay is the histological alteration. Uh, here we uh, for that we uh, dissected the organisms and we remove uh, osophagus because we focus on the uh, this uh, tissue. Uh, especially uh, why we uh, use this uh, tissue because it's a first part of digestive tract. Also, it's a, uh, it's narrow of the uh, digestive tract. And uh, we focus on the uh, epithelial thickness and the length of creeps of the esophagus using two different uh, stainings which are periodic uh, acid shift and hematoxin and eosin. Okay, let's talk about the results. Um, uh, as you know, respiration rate uh, illustrates the uh, change in metabolic activity of organisms. So it's an uh, important parameter. Uh, uh, as you see this figure, uh, the respiration rate uh, didn't significantly change uh, in the treatment groups. 
so uh, what's the meaning of that? Uh, we uh, evaluated uh, the uh, organisms uh, might uh, not need to uh, enter metabolic uh, depression by the stressor's effect, or uh, the organisms didn't uh, need to increase their respiration uh, to obtain more energy and maintain their homeostasis. If we look at the total ceramocyte count, uh, uh, as you see, there is a decreasing tendency here in the treatments, uh, especially in triple uh, in the triple uh, apply. Uh, there is a sig significant decreasing. And uh, so what's the meaning of that? Uh, it is um, mainly uh, the migration of uh, pseudomosis uh, might, uh, um, from, uh, might migrate uh, from the uh, fluid to the uh, other tissues. Uh, so decreasing uh, of the pseudomosis uh, in the pseudomic flu fluid. The uh, other uh, reason uh, axial organ uh, might be negatively affected by the stressor. Uh, we hypothesize uh, that because uh, axial organ uh, has a play uh, role uh, in the uh, ceramocyte proliferation, uh, differentiation, and uh, release of ceramocytes into the ceramic fluid. Uh, so uh, this is the other reason. It might be other reason. For the ceramocyte uh, viability, we focus on the each uh, ceramocyte types uh, of viability. Um, uh, if you uh, look at all four uh, these figures, you will see mainly uh, uh, decreasing. Uh, uh, Ceramocyte viabilities in all uh, ceramocytes. Uh, they are mainly affected by the stressors. Uh, these might be related to necrosis and lysis of the cells uh, by the effect uh, of the stressors. And uh, here, microplastics uh, might physically affect to the uh, Ceramocytes. Uh, if you consider ocean acidification, it, it might affect the uh, homeostasis of the organisms, or uh, and or uh, acid uh, base balance of the ceramic fluid. Uh, and lanthanum might re, uh, chemi uh, chemically might have chemically uh, effect on uh, these uh, cells. Uh, it is also uh, used uh, instead of uh, calcium ions, as you know. So uh, uh, it can be placed in this uh, in this area, and uh, it uh, might have uh, chemical toxicity. Toxicity uh, is these places. Sorry. The other uh, uh, results are related to the histopathological chains. Uh, here we focus on two parts. Uh, one of that is uh, the creep lens. As you see on the left side, uh, the first one on the upper uh, left, uh, the first one is the control group and the uh, they creep one of uh, each one uh, is the creep, as you see. Uh, the creep is uh, long normally in the control group, but uh, after the uh, stressors applied in some uh, treatments, uh, they uh, are sh uh, shortened, uh, as you see. It's sorry, especially uh, uh, in the groups of uh, ocean acidification and lanthanum combined in uh, microplastic and lanthanum combined. 
and only micropla microplastic and only ocean acidification. Uh, in the middle uh, figure showed the significant uh, changes. If you uh, focus on that, on the upper uh, figure. And uh, if we uh, focus on the uh, right side, uh, here we focus on the epithelial uh, thickness. As you see on the left upper, uh, the normally uh, epithelial thickness is like that. But after the uh, stressor ap application, in, uh, in the similar groups, um, the uh, shortening the epithelial thickness uh, were observed. Uh, in, in the ocean acidification and lanthanum uh, combined, uh, in uh, uh, microplastic lanthanum uh, combined and in microplastic and uh, in ocean acidification. Uh, the reasons uh, for uh, these uh, uh, results uh, might be again uh, microplastic, uh, the physical effect of the microplastic, the uh, Ocean uh, acidification effects uh, might uh, change the uh, acid base uh, balance. And also, uh, lanthanum uh, effect, uh, not uh, only individual, but combined effect. Uh, here, uh, their chemical toxicity uh, might be. So, as a conclusion, uh, we didn't observe any mortality during the uh, experimental uh, period. And we uh, also didn't observe any respiration rate changes, but we uh, observed a, decrease, a decreasing tendency in the total uh, serum size, especially in the triple stressor application. And uh, for the uh, so, uh, solomocyte viability, we observed uh, significant decreases. And about the uh, histological alterations, and uh, we uh, observed shortening the creep land and thinning the epithelial thickness. Uh, actually, these uh, extracts to the atrophy, the uh, creep structure. Uh, we uh, actually have not uh, completed uh, this study yet because we are uh, we uh, still study on the transcriptomics and uh, proteomics profiles. Uh, I think after we uh, we completed this uh, data, we will have a, a, a good evaluation on the uh, all the parameters. And of course, we suggest new studies on the uh, applications of uh, the similar stressors, but at different values and using different species and uh, using uh, longer exposure periods. Thank you for listening to me. And I'm uh, grateful for uh, my colleagues uh, for their uh, great uh, efforts. Thank you so much, Andor, for, for this uh, nice talk. And now the floor is for our audience, actually, for, for questions. So I'm going to ask uh, all our speakers and uh, ask the moderators also to, to, to turn on the camera. And uh, so to, to check, could you please stop sharing your screen, Andor? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I am starting to see a couple of questions. And uh, the first one is to Frederic. So would you like to respond to that, Frédéric? Yes, thank you, Abed. So for the first one, you mean? Yes, uh, love the mobile lab idea. Could you share how to design a similar mobile lab for countries lacking in situ infrastructure aquariums for ocean acidification research? Additionally, can you provide an estimate of the approximate cost to build one? That's a very detailed question, but it's a very interesting one, of course. Well, I, I would encourage, the, because since it's, it's anonymous, I don't know who it is, but I would encourage this person to contact me directly because 
definitely that will be a, a long answer and I don't want to take all the time, but just to just really quickly, then uh, we are finalizing now uh, um, a technical paper that will be submitted to aquaculture engineering in the, in the coming weeks. So all the details will be available, all the providers of the sensors and the, the valves, et cetera, et cetera, that will be available in the paper. But if it's really uh, uh, urgent, let's say I can, I can send to this person the, the draft paper. Uh, for the cost, this is, I don't have the answer now, but I would say you have to count between 50,000 and 100,000 euros for, for a complete, complete container. The container doesn't cost anything, but you need to 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 add uh, lots of furnishment inside uh, all the sensors are pretty expensive and you need very accurate and sensors that do not drift and this is uh since we have we want to have an automatized thing but we, we don't want to calibrate the sensor every day definitely so you need to make, put some money uh, on that That's, and and but yes call me or send me an email and i will provide a more accurate answer Thank you, Frederick. So the second question is also for you. You're popular today. If there's other questions for other speakers, please let us know as well. Uh, so the second question is, based on your data, did the owner of the lagoon farm report any increased mortality in the bivalves during marine heat waves or coastal acidification? So this is difficult for us based on the result we have to know if it's uh, heat waves in summer that are a problem. But I'm pretty sure, I'm 99% sure this is temperature that is acting and not pH in summer. So yes, we have we have more mortality definitely in summer and especially in the tall lagoon, we have another problem which is oxygen availability. And this is something very common in the lagoon when the water is very, temperature. the temperature of the water is really high. You have a, a very low uh, availability. So anoxia uh, events are occurring very, very often, and these are the cause of really high mortality. Uh, but as you saw, we didn't see a high mortality of mussels under ambient condition this summer, even with the heat waves that uh, that appeared. But if you increase by uh, one, two, and three degrees, then we basically override the capacity of uh, of the organisms to tolerate this high temperature for several weeks. So this is still this is a problem right now. A small problem, which definitely will become a major problem in the coming decades. I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much, Frederic. I don't see so much uh, uh, so questions, other questions. So we uh, gonna ask our speakers. Actually, I can start with a question for for uh, 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 Patricia. Uh, Patricia, why do you think the logic studies are much less compared to the Bentec? Is it because it's more difficult to study pelagic groups compared to the benthic groups. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Abed. So one of the, um, well, there are several uh, explanations. So the first one, I think, is about classifications. So classification has probably been the most important process address when addressing biological response to acidification. And if you look at the organism that calcify in the benthic habitat versus pelagic habitat, there are many more organisms that, that calcify in the benthic habitat. So of course, in pelagic, you have just a couple, a few, I would say three or four. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one. Uh, one other uh, possible explanation is, is in many studies uh, addressing acidification in the natural environment, as you saw from the plot, they actually have, have been done in CO2 sites, CO2 vent sites, so CO2 sips. And of course, uh, this is a perfect uh, setting for studying benthics because you have like this nice natural laboratory to study organisms and community at very low pH and, and, and uh, like normal or present pH. And you have a gradient and you can then study for the benthic that are fixed to a substrate. And pelagic, of course, they have a different issue. So that's, I think, for me, these are the two main reasons, uh, probably. One is the classification, the that, and the other one is the techniques. Uh, Patricia, now we're talking about the benthic and the pelagic um, resistance. You showed in your in your um, presentation that there was like a, a resistance in the bacteria and the pelagic realm, which are studied most. So um, do you think this is the same uh, for the benthic? realm as well for for that particular group or are there any differences between the resistance in them 
benthic uh, bacteria and the pelagic bacteria? In principle, I don't know, <laughs> but I will expect uh, probably a similar a similar response. I will expect so. Uh, also because, um, yeah, the, the conditions, so these are not deep sea uh, benthic system. I mentioned that they are mainly coastal, so relatively shallow water. So um, yeah, the conditions can be quite similar to shallow water pelagic systems. Yeah. So I don't know, but I think it would be similar. But most of the study are on the yeah on the pelagic uh, bacteria, so the plankton. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia. Uh, I have uh, actually a question for Under. So I know yeah. it's very complicated uh, because you, you are already studying multiple stressors, but are you yeah. planning to do also to incorporate ocean warming, the oxygenation among the, stressor, uh, the stressors that you are already uh, investigating, or it's like really too complicated to do that? Yeah, thank you for the question. That's a good question, Abed. Uh, actually, we are studying on the uh, other uh, stressors, like, as you said, uh, uh, hypoxic uh, and uh, ocean acidification, uh, or uh, with the uh, uh, other uh, uh, heat wave uh, uh, effects. Uh, all, all these uh, are, uh, can be used as combined uh to see the multi stressor effect this this uh, multi the multi stressor effect is very uh, to uh, obtain the effects uh, is very important uh, because it is a realistic approach uh, uh, the other uh, side on the other side on the uh, focus on the ocean acidification or the uh, uh, any other uh, uh, individual uh, uh, stressor. Uh, of course, uh, they are meaningful. They uh, provide meaningful data, uh, but uh, uh, if we focus on the multi stressor uh, effects, we can obtain uh, very meaningful uh, data set. Uh, uh, they uh, the the hypoxic condition. Uh, ocean acidification condition and uh, related to this, these stressors are very important, but we uh, should uh, also focus on the uh, uh, chemicals with these uh, stressors. Uh, under the ocean uh, acidification conditions, how uh, chemicals uh, are uh, accumulated and uh, how they uh, effects on the uh, organisms uh, after their accumulation. So uh, this is also uh, another important point. Thank you. I, I have a question for Sven. So your um, your talk was about the Mediterranean basin. And, and of course, it's not fair if I'm going to ask you now something outside the Mediterranean basin. But I, but I would like to know how... Um, um, comparable the the results you obtained are to to other type basins do you see the same trends is is there any difference in in rates um and and uh, are there a lot of other studies to compare with um, thank you for the question um this similar study has been done for example in Santa Barbara basin uh, which saw also like a decrease in the uh, yeah in size normalized rates during the biogen classification um, of like the same species, but in general, like this time frame we are, we are looking at, so at the anthropogenic acidification, uh, the studies are not so um, abundant. So there is a few studies is dealing with that, like from like a paleo environmental perspective. And uh, to the question, how like this resource could be transferred into other ocean regions? Um, in general, I would say they can be transferred into other uh, um, um, ocean regions and ocean acidification is like a global phenomenon, right? That's happening more or less um, in the global ocean. But at the same time, it's also difficult or complicated since the Mediterranean is in that kind of term special. So it has like a really high alkalinity and it has really fast turnover, which makes like the basin really susceptible to like the carbon uptake. And uh, this is not the case in most of the other regions where like turnover rates are much lower and the alkalinity is lower as well. 
So yeah, you, you start here from another level in the Mediterranean than in other ocean regions. Um, but yeah, as we see like this drop of pH during the next century is um, valid for like all the ocean regions. Thank you so much, Sven. Uh, another question by Maria. Thank you, Maria, for the question. Do you plan under, it's for you, do you plan to repeat multi-stressor experiment also on parasantrotus, which seems more vulnerable to ocean acidification? Uh, uh, on the parasantrotus lividus? So parasantrotus, yeah. Uh, our, our species is uh, Arbastia lixula. Uh, but uh, some uh, st studies, as I know, uh, on the paracentrotus lividus uh, using the ocean acidification. Uh, but uh, we, we didn't uh, use the paracentrotus lividus. Uh, for the next studies, uh, yes, uh, it can be used. Uh, it is uh, common also in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the distribution uh, of paracentatus uh, is also common, and it's also uh, preferred uh, to consume by the uh, people like this uh, species. Thank you so much, Andor. We hope that um, so that that was a clear response to you, Maria. Anyways, I mean, all all our uh, our speakers do, do uh, have already shared their emails. So if you have any further question, also you can ask them directly. I do have just the last question for Frederic. Uh, Frederic, my question for you is that <clears throat> so um, we know that more and more um, connections and communications are needed for stakeholders, especially that you are also dealing with. Uh, uh, aquaculture uh, stakeholders for are you are you how are you communicating with them your results etc and maybe to also fund some of your research is there like regular meetings to show them the importance of um, uh, your studies and to support and fund that or not really no no absolutely and that was the that was the main objective of the project which is a very applied project we wanted to answer the questions of the shellfish farmers basically there was a meeting with shellfish farmers in 2019 i believe or 2018 where they were not happy with what we were doing because we were not providing clear answers on what will be their future and they the basic thing is that we showed them there was Laurent Bob that was that was there, a great modeler, and he was showing pH data from the China Sea. And uh, the French farmers were saying, but it's not like we don't completely care about uh, the pH in the China Sea. But what we want to know is how we will be able to continue our job in the coming decades and not in the end of the century. Me, I want to care about my children. I want to care about my job and the one of my children, because usually it's a family thing, you know, shellfish farming in France, at least maybe not everywhere so they wanted us to provide clear data on on the short time scale and really focused on their area of production so that's what we did and the project was organized around a really strong collaboration with the shellfish farming associations both on the regional uh, part but also on the national so we have uh, one of the partners which is the Comité national de la conchiliculture shellfish farming national committee and we participate to many events where we provide our, our conclusions to the shellfish farmers. And definitely that's a great help also to communicate that way, like this, because of course to get funding, it's much easier, uh, definitely, especially to the EMFF, which aided the shellfish, well, the aquaculture part now, uh, clearly in their, in their text. So yes, I think this has been a very uh, successful collaboration that we have been uh, doing. It's very interesting. Thank you so much, Frederic, and for all our speakers and for my co-chair, for Iris. And now uh, um, the floor is for Sarah. So thank you so much. We hope that this session was seen like an interesting one and that we've all learned something as well. Thank you, Sarah, uh, everyone. And uh, the floor is yours, Sarah. Thank you so much, Aved. And um, I just want to start by thanking the moderators and the speakers for such a great session. That was a really wonderful overview of all the research that's going on in the Mediterranean. So great job, MedHub. Um, we look forward to, to seeing what comes next. Um, we also want to thank the audience for joining us for OA Week 2023 today. Um, 
We really appreciate your participation and please don't forget to look at our website um, and register for any other sessions that may interest you. We have a few great ones coming up today and tomorrow before we close out uh, the 2023 away week. Um, please, if you would like to stay up to date with the Goa On community, consider signing up as a Goa On med member um, at goaon.org. If you are in the Mediterranean region, please join the MedHub. They are very, very active. They send out a great newsletter. You can keep up to date with them on Twitter, um, and you can sign up for that as well on the Goa On website. And finally, um, if you would like to learn more about ocean acidification research for sustainability, which is Goa On's UN Ocean Decade endorsed project, um, please scan this QR code and you can learn about making your ORS um, commitment. Uh, thank you all and see you next time.